Congratulations, you've made it to Calculus 1. So before we get into the nitty gritty of calculus, we better do a bit of a review of both our algebra and functions so we're ready to rumble. Um, I'll be throwing in some new material as well here, but that's totally fine. If it doesn't register, we're going to come back to it. I just thought I'd uh, show it to you right now. The first thing we want to revisit are our exponent laws. So remembering that if bases are the same, or even with numbers, you can use exponent laws to simplify these into something with a single exponent. All right, so our first one, uh, let's take this bad Larry right here. If your base is unmultiplied, you get to add the exponents. And let's think about that. So if we have x4 times x2, we can really write that as x4 is x times x times x times x, and then x2 is another couple x's, right? So count them up. How many do you get? x6. So the exponent law is if the bases are multiplied, the exponents are added. For dividing, it makes sense that we'd have something kind of similar. So let's say x5 divided by x over 3. Let's draw it out. We got five x's in the numerator. We've got three x's in the denominator. And if we go old school canceling, we can drop all these x's and end up with x to the power of two, which is the same as if we took the exponent in the numerator and subtracted, whoops, I changed it to a six, it's a five, exponent of the numerator and subtracted the exponent in the denominator. Another good exponent law is power of a power. So let's say we had x squared and we cubed that whole thing. All right, so let's draw it out and see what happens. We have x squared and then we cube it. So we multiply it by itself three times. There's one, there's two, there's three. So x squared times x squared times x squared. And we see that's going to make x to the power of six. So our exponent law for power of a power, so if you have a base and it's to another power, you're just going to multiply the exponents. We can take this one and apply it to a lot of dis different situations. So say I had uh, 3xy4 and I wanted to square that. Here we kind of distribute to everything within the brackets. Be careful, three squared is not six, it's still nine. Numbers always behave as they should. It's the variables that do something a little funky. If you have a plain old x, that's the same as x to the power of one, one times two, x squared. And y to the power of four squared becomes four times two y to the power of eight. Likewise, if you were to have fraction and you wanted to cube it, you ex apply that cube to everything that is in the brackets. So we're gonna get five cubed, 125. X cubed, three cubed is 27. Y squared cubed is Y to the power of six. Negative exponents are one <laughs> people really don't enjoy. That's fine. I get it. So let's say we have x to the power of negative 2. To deal with the negative exponent, you are going to take the reciprocal of the base. So just flip the base. The base is the x, right? So if I take the reciprocal of x, think of it a fraction as x over 1. If I invert that, I get 1 over x. When I do that, notice I drop the negative in the exponent, that's what you're allowed to do. And then I can just kind of be like, I know that one squared is one, and I can leave it like this. Now, be very careful <laughs> what gets to flip and what doesn't. So if I had something like y to the five over two, let's use a good old x to the negative two, and we'll put it on the bottom, okay? The negative exponent is only acting 
on this single x. The 2 is not in brackets, so it just stays where it is. The y to the power of 5 doesn't have a negative exponent. It doesn't get to do the flip. It doesn't take the reciprocal. So this part is 1 over x to the negative 2. If I invert that, I'm going to get x. I make the exponent positive, x squared over 1, which is just x squared. So my entire fraction would change to x squared y to the power of 5 over 2. This is a tricky one. And the last exponent law I want to mention that we've already seen is what if the exponent is 0. So no matter what your base is, if it's to the power of 0, it's equivalent to 1. So it could be 453 to the power of 0. You can replace it with a 1. It could be a Christmas tree. That's not a good Christmas tree. To the power of 0 it's still going to be 1. So we'll go through a couple of examples and I want you to bear in mind that with exponent laws there's usually like several different methods to get to the same answer. So if you've already solved this and you're just comparing how I did it and it's completely different, that's fine as long as we got to the same answer. So we're going to start at the top here in the light blue. What's another way of expressing 2 over 3x to the power of 4? Well, we could leave the 2 over 3 as a coefficient and then deal with that x to the 4, which is kind of like a 1 over x to the 4. We could convert that to x to the negative 4, right? And that will flip it, take the reciprocal. So you could express this as 2 over 3 x to the negative 4, or put it all in the numerator. And this is kind of like counter what we did in our level one math course where we're always getting rid of negative exponents. In order to do some differentiation uh, work with calculus, we're often going to make negative exponents because they're easier to work with. But more on that later. So let's look at this example right here. We've got a lot going on. So I'm going to simplify in the numerator and in the denominator separately. And then I'm going to go afterwards and combine everything and, and, and simplify my results. Okay, so looking at the numerator, I have a 3 and an 8. I can multiply those and make 24. I have x to the power of 4 and x to the power of 1. They are multiplied as well, so I'm just going to add the exponents to make x to the power of 5. y to the power of 3 and y to the power of 4 is going to create y to the power of 7. So there's my simplified numerator. Looking at my denominator, there's a lot going on, but this 2 is a power of a power. So it's going to apply to everything in there. Remember, 6 to the power of 2 is 36, not 12. It's the most common mistake, so I harp on it. Um, x squared squared is multiplied, so we're multiplying this time. x to the power of 4, and then y cubed to the power of 2 multiply the exponents, power of a power, get y to the power of 6. All right, so we've cleaned it up a lot. My next step is just going to be to look at each thing separately. You can do this a different way maybe, but uh, and then resolve what's going on that way. So if I see 24 over 36, I'm going to simplify that to 2 over 3. If I see x to the 5 over x to the 4, the math I'm going to do is to subtract the components and I get x to the power of 1. And if I see y to the 7 over y to the 6, the math I'm going to do is once again subtraction, and I end up with y to the power of 1, or just plain y. So now I'm going to put this all back together, and I'm going to have 2xy over 3, final answer. For the example in the pink box, I'm going to do it one way and then I'm going to do it again another way. So my preferred way is to always clean up within the brackets first before dealing with any exponents on the outside. So normally I'd be like, okay, what are we going to have? Break it down. I can't really reduce that. I'm just going to set it aside. The x, I'm going to subtract the denominator exponent from the numerator exponent it gives me plain old x. I'm going to do the same with the y, continuing to use 
e quotient rule y to the negative 1. And I'm just going to be like, hey, that's the same as 1 over y. And then z's, I could change that z on the top into the number 1, but I'll just follow through with the math. 0, subtract the 7 from the denominator, and I get z to the negative 7, which I can rewrite as 1 over z to the 7. All right, so I'm going to take this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece, and smash it back together. So negative 2 on the top, 3 on the bottom, x on the top, y on the bottom, and z7 on the bottom. I feel like I'm multiplying them all back together again. At this point, I still have that negative exponent. So I'm going to deal with this right now. When you have a negative exponent, you flip or take the reciprocal of the base. This base is our whole fraction here. And then you can make the exponent positive. So I invert the fraction. And because that negative exponent is acting on everything, everything moves. And the exponent becomes positive. And my last step will just be to square everything I see in the brackets. 3 becomes 9. Y becomes y squared. Z becomes 14. Negative 2 becomes 4. And x becomes x squared. Final answer. For my second way, I am going to deal with the negative exponent first. So I will invert the entire fraction. 3x squared y cubed z7 is now in the numerator. Negative 2x cubed y squared, I want to be careful, z0 is now in the denominator. And everything's squared. And maybe I'll now distribute that 2 to everything in. The fraction. It's not my normal way, so I'm kind of like, oh. <laughs> okay, so we've got 9x4, y6, z, 14, and then on the bottom, the square makes 4x6, y4, and you know what? At this point, I'm going to be like z0 squared is z0, which is 1, so I'm just going to drop the z anything multiplied by 1 is just the same thing. Okay, I'm not done because I still have to simplify my x's and y's. So I leave the 9, and if I do the x, and I leave the 4, sorry. For the x's, I'm going to do this math, division, subtract the exponents, you're going to get x in the negative 2, which puts an x in the denominator. For y, I have y to the 6 minus 4, which is y to the positive 2. Well, stays the same. That goes in the numerator. And then z14 stays where it is. And it's time for a new exponent law. What to do with a fractional with exponents, which we also call rational exponents, because that's a fraction. Uh, so here we've started, and it's not really shown, but the original thing would have been x to the power of m over n. And if you want to change that, this is expressed as an exponent, if you want to change it back into a root, which we call a radical, so expressing it in radical form, this is what happens. The top number stays with the x, just like x to the power of m would be x to the power of n. But the weird thing is the fractional component. It goes in the hook of the radical. Okay, so looking at this one, if we took 27 and we wanted to do it to the, the power of 2 thirds, I create the radical hook and I throw the 3 in there. So it's a cube root that we're going to take. And then we have of 27 squared. And notice we can write this a lot of different ways. We can do the square first and do the cube root of 729, which will equal 9. Or we could do the cube root first of 27, which is 3, and then square it and get 9. It doesn't matter. Just do whatever works best for you. So looking at another couple examples, if I was to take x to the power of 2 over 5, the numerator stays with the base, and the denominator becomes the degree of the radical or the root. There we go. 
And if we wanted to go backwards, say I had something like this, how would I express that as an exponent? Well, what power is x2? To? to the power of 1. So there's the numerator. What's the degree of the radical? It's the cube root. There we go. It's a weird one too. So let's look at our top question here. How else could we express this algebra mess here? <laughs> well, first things I would think about doing is like, okay, let's leave it as a big fraction, but maybe I could change, you know, the four root of x to the power of five into an exponent, a fractional exponent. So x is my base, the numerator is five, and the degree of the radical is four, so that's a denominator. So I have one over x to the power of five over four. Cool, cool. I could also write that if I was thinking about calculus and how I like to have, you know, negative exponents back in as x to the power of negative five over four. So options, options, options. Let's look at this question. Normally I'd be like, well, you can't simplify that. That's a hot mess. I don't even know what to do with that. But let's consider what we know now. Now we know that the numerator could be expressed as an exponent, a fractional exponent, x to the power of one over four. The denominator could be expressed as a fractional as well, x to the power of one over three. And I know that I have a division law, a division exponent law that tells me that if I wanted to put that as a base with a single exponent, numerator, exponent, subtract, denominator, exponent, and unfortunately, this is going to bring back some fraction math. You need a common denominator. So if that would be 12, I could have x to the power of 3 over 12 minus 4 over 12. And I could realize that this is also equivalent to x to the power of negative 1 over 12. This is my u most useful calculus form. If I was feeling fancy pants, I could maybe invert it. make it a positive exponent in the denominator, or I could turn it back into a radical form. These are all equivalent, 12 root x. So those are all valid simplifications. Good, good, good. And now let's look at our last example here. So we're gonna apply, nothing can be cleaned up in the brackets, so I've gotta apply that fractional exponent to everything in my brackets, power over power. All right, so let's just keep the eight here. We're gonna do the cube root of eight squared. And then we're gonna do x to the power of six times two thirds. I'm just gonna do steps for this, 12 thirds. I'm gonna do y to the power of one, negative one half times two thirds. I'm just gonna do lazy, multiplying those exponents. Remember your fraction multiplication as well. Now let's continue to simplify. So the cube root of eight is two. Two squared is four. So that can be simplified to four. This is just x to the power of four, right? 12 over three. We'll bring her down, x4, and this could be simplified to y to the negative 1 over 3, which could be simplified to 1 over y to the 1 third. And if we smash those together, we have options for x cubed, for, sorry, x to the power of 4 over y to the power of 1 third, or even for x to the power of four cube root of y. Good, good. One last example to wrap up exponent law review and introduction of fractional exponents. I'm gonna clean this one up in the brackets first. So I'm looking at my x's and I have x two minus four equals x to the negative two equals one over x squared. Okay, that's done. Looking at the y's, I have y to the power of negative one half minus, and what is this? This is y to the one half as well, right? 
there we go. So if you do that math, you're going to get y to the power of negative 1, which is simply 1 over y. So, so far, I have gotten to 1 over x squared y to the power of 3 over 5. So now I have options about how I want to express this. I could take it and create messy, messy. 1 over 5 root x squared y to the power of 3. That's totally valid. I could also write it as, let's see, I could apply that, that cube and have 1 over 5 root x 6y cubed. And then, it, you know, I could get super fancy and be like, oh, hey, I can take out an x from under that 5 power root and have 1 over x 5 root x y cubed. But that's, that's really taking it far. These are all good. Now it's time for a, a high speed <laughs> tour of polynomials and what we can do it with them. So recall that a polynomial is an algebraic expression. So that's with variables and numbers, and it's going to have one or more terms and terms are separated by addition and subtraction. So let's put down an example. Here's three X to the power of five minus seven X to the power of seven plus 12. Okay. First step we're always going to start thinking about putting them in, in order. So the biggest exponent gets to go first. Negative seven x to the power of seven plus three x to the power of five plus 12. And this is just gonna give us some more information when we get into figuring out limits and other kind of end behaviors. All right, so let's talk first about the number of terms separated by plus or minus one, two, three terms. So we have three terms. The degree goes with the leading term. So the one with the biggest exponent. So the biggest exponent is the degree. So that was a lot of messy talk to say the degree of this particular equation is seven. Or polynomial rather. Our leading coefficient is the number that goes with that first term and it's negative seven. Okay, so looking at how it was originally given to us like this, we would have to rearrange it to get that uh, leading term visible, or you know, you just know that this is actually your leading term and you draw everything you need from there. Let's do another example quickly, uh, an easy one. Eight to the power of x minus eight to the power of 12, putting it in order gives you negative x to the power of 12 plus x to the power of 8. How many terms? I see 2. What's the degree? 12, because it's the biggest, biggest exponent. What's the leading coefficient? I see a negative in front of that x to the power of 12. Leading coefficient is negative 1. And we're going to revisit our methods of simplifying polynomials. Uh, first thing we're going to look at is collecting like terms over here. And remembering that like terms means that the variables match. Okay, so when I look at this first one, I see a lot of x's and y's, but they have to match up in the same numbers for them to be considered like terms. So which ones are like terms? Well, the first one, three x squared y. Do I see another term that has x squared y in it? Yes, I do. These are like terms. For the rest of the equation, x, y is not the same as x, y squared. So they can't combine with each other or with either the first or the fourth term. So the only math I can do happens here in the coefficients. 3 minus 2 is 1. I'm going to write the 1 for now. It's optional. And you don't change the variable. Okay, it stays the same when you're collecting like terms. And then if I couldn't do anything with the other two pieces, I just write them down again. And like I said, that 1 is optional. Now, looking at our second question, I see x's. That's fine. 3 minus 1 is 2x. I know I can simplify that. But I also see this 4 root x and this negative 7 root x. Well, now I know that root x is really x to the power of 1 half. So, yeah, these are just variables with exponents. So I can combine them. So I can combine 
positive 4 and negative 7 to make negative 3 and keep that root x behind it. Redivisiting distribution. If you have a number a sing or a single term in front of brackets, you must distribute it by multiplying it with everything within the brackets. So in this case, 3 times 2 is 6. And then we use our exponent laws to deal with x to the x squared and x to the power of 4. 2 plus 4 is 6. Moving to the 3y, 3 times 3 is 9. And then the exponents are all different, so I'm just going to write them down and not do anything. That's what you do. Moving to the 12, 3 times 12 is 36. And I don't have anything for the x squared to multiply with, so I just write it down. That's pretty awesome. Next we have a binomial expansion, so remembering you can use the acronym FOIL, which means multiply first terms, or whatever within, and then the outside, and then the inside, and then the last, and clean up if you can. Uh, another method that's quite popular is the array that works well too, so just drawing this one up there so we see it once. Put one of your terms, doesn't matter which one, across the top, x plus 12. Put your other one down the side, 2x minus 3, and then just multiply everything. So 2x times x equals 2x squared. And then moving over, 2x times 12 is 24x. So just filling in the table, minus 3 times x is negative 3x. And very small writing, and negative 3 times 12 is negative 36 and then combining all the terms to say that expansion will result in a trinomial 2x squared. I can combine 24x with negative 3x to make positive 21x minus 36. And the last thing I want to revisit is when you see a binomial squared, you recognize the answer is not going to be 4x squared plus 64. You must treat the math the same as you did in the last question. So yes, 4x squared for the first, but you have to do that 16x and 16x, 32x, and last, 64. All right, so that's expanding. Factoring is like dividing a bit. <laughs> so when we are factoring, we are going to find, for this first example, we have common factoring. So we're just going to find anything that we can take out of all terms that are present. So I look, here's two terms. I look at each component. So looking at the numbers, I have 3 and negative 18. 3 is common to both. So I can take out a 3. And I have in a variable y, it's to the power of 2 and to the power of 3. I take out the smaller power. And then I have a binomial, 4x plus 5. It's to the power of 1 and to the power of 3. So I can take out 4x plus 5 to the power of 1. So this I'm going to give it a yellow piece here, is what I can divide both of my terms by. When I do that division, I'm going to use a bigger different bracket. If I take 3y squared onto 4x plus 5 to the power of 3 and divide it by this yellow highlighted thing, 3 divided by 3 is 1, y squared divided by y squared is 1, so those disappear. Um, and for the binomial, it's to the power of 3 divided by the power of 1, so I'm left with this. Looking at my second term, negative 18 divided by 3 is minus 6. y cubed divided by y squared is a single y. And that's it. And now you would have the option to expand the binomial and see if you can simplify further. I know I can't, so I'm walking away right now. So this is my answer. Remembering also when we did quadratic factoring that we sometimes had a situation like this where we had a difference of squares and we had to remember the trick. Take the root of both terms but don't just leave the negative alone. So there we go. The root of 4x squared is 2x. The root of 25 is 5 and then combine them in two binomials that have identical numbers or variables but one has a plus one has a minus. So 2x minus 5 2x plus 5. Our last example is a straight up factoring one. So however you learned it before, I like the AC line. So the product line, something times something is going to equal negative 30. And those same two 
integers, hopefully, <laughs> if I add them together, will equal positive 13. So you have to find factors of 30 that are 13 apart. Um, so, you know, it's always tempting to use 3 and 10, but that won't work out in this one. Is the tricky one where it's going to be 15 and 2. I know one of them has to be negative in order to make this work. And I see that in order to have a positive 13, I want the 2 to be negative. And then I just rewrite as a set of binomials. x plus 15, there's one factor. x minus 2. Check your answer. Make sure you can get back up to here when you do the expansion. Here's this word rational again. You'll remember that rational expressions are just algebraic fractions, so they can have polynomials on the top and the bottom. Um, what I want to bring in now, so we can uh, look at it more with functions, are restrictions. So restrictions are things that x is not allowed to be. So if I look at example 1, I have 3 over 2x. Well, what is x never allowed to be? What's the rule? You can never have a fraction that's a number or anything over 0. So if x were 0, that means this fraction would be 3 over 0, and that's not allowed. So the restriction, for example, 1, x cannot be equal to 0. Now let's look at example 2. I'm going to use some factoring tricks here to see if I can simplify it more. I can't do anything with the top, but I see that the bottom is a difference of squares. So I can factor that root of x squared and root of 2. So I get x minus 2, x plus 2. And that doesn't help me cancel anything, <laughs> but it does show me what the restrictions are. So x can't be anything that makes 0 on the bottom. So if x is 2, we're going to have 0 times 4, which is no good. And if x is negative 2, we're going to have negative 4 times 0, and that is no good. So x is not allowed to be equal to plus or minus 2. Can x be negative 5? Sure. If you have 0 over a number, that just equals 0. That's fine. So the restrictions come from the denominator only. And looking at example 3, another fun one we can factor top and bottom and see what we've got. That trinomial on the top is going to factor to x plus 2 onto x plus 1. And on the bottom, I'll use common factoring to pull out 2x. And that will leave behind x plus 2. All right, so my restrictions, do your restrictions before you do any cancelling. And we'll talk about that in a bit too. All right, so x cannot be equal to 0, right? Because if 2 times 0 times 2 is 0. So x is not equal to 0. And x is also not equal to negative 2. But this is also a rational expression that can be simplified. Those could cancel, and I could have x plus 1 over 2x, which means this restriction is going to be a different type of restriction than the first one that couldn't cancel. More on that in functions. So our last slide. We just did this, a bit of cancelling, so let's revisit it really quickly again. When I have a fraction that looks like this, these two can cancel right away. I can see that. What about what's left behind? I'll just rewrite. I'll factor the top. That's a difference of squares. And I will common factor the bottom. And then I see I can cancel some more. And I've got some crazy thing to just basically a linear equation. There we go. And my restriction would have been x couldn't be equal to 3 because of this x right here. If we add and subtract fractions, rational expressions, we probably need a lowest common denominator so we can combine them into a single fraction. Sometimes that's what we want to do. So what do I see in my three denominators? I see numbers, 4 and 2. The lowest common denominator, multiple of 4 and 2 is 4 because 2 fits into 4. I see a variable plain x. I only see it in one location. This is different. This is a binomial, so I'm going to write down that as part of the lowest common denominator. And then I'm going to take the binomial as well. So I basically have to take 
each fraction, multiply it, the numerator, by what's missing in the denominator so that I can make it part of a single fraction. So looking at the 2, it is over x minus 1. So it's missing the 4x from here. And then I had 1 over 2x. How do I turn 2x into 4x onto x minus 1? Well, I have to multiply it by 2. I've already got an x, and I have to multiply in an x minus 1. And then looking at the 3, what do I need to add to that? Well, in the denominator, I already have the 4, but I don't have the x, and I don't have the x minus 1. Sorry, next door neighbor, going in there. And now we can start simplifying on the top. 8x plus multiplying 2x minus 2 minus 3x squared, watch your negatives, plus 3x. That will still be over my 4x, 1 to x minus 1. I'm just being lazy for that thing. I'm going to put everything in descending order on the top now. So negative 3x squared goes first. I can combine 8 plus 2 is 10 plus 3 plus 13x. And then all that's left is minus 2. And then I put onto 4x, or over, sorry, 4x onto x minus 1. Restrictions, x can't be equal to 0, x can't be equal to 1. So that's one thing we do. Another trick we sometimes use is the opposite action where we divide or separate them out, right? We took these three fractions in adding and subtracting and made them into 1. Here, I'm just going to start by splitting to see if I can simplify that way. So I'm going to start here, and I might do another split. And as long as they're all over, that same denominator, it's fine. And then 1 over 12x to the power of 5. So I'm going to simplify on each one. 4 over 12 is like 1 over 3, so I know I'm going to have 3 in the denominator. And then x squared over x5 can change that to 3x cubed. So that's exponent laws or cancelling, whatever works for you. And what do I have left? Just 2x plus 7. On my second fraction, 6 over 12 is like 1 over 2. x to the power 4 over x to the power 1, that all goes away. And I'm going to have 1 over 2x. Cool. And then my third fraction I can't do anything with. I could split this first one again and get 2x over 3x cubed, which I could simplify to 2 over 3x squared. And then I have a really gross fraction <laughs> I can't do much with. Make sure I have that on the bottom. Sorry, that's hard to see. And then 1 plus, sorry, 1 over 2x. And okay, this doesn't look great, but let me tell you, if we were about to do some derivative finding, we would be happy with this version as opposed to the original one because we could represent this with negative exponents and it wouldn't be too bad. So here we go. This is what you like for calculus. But we're not there yet. All right, that's the algebra review.